talking here about exoplanets and if you're comfortable with the notion of an exoplanet um, let's uh, take a specific example 51 Pegasus uh, one of the first planets outside our solar system that was discovered and and just to remind you there's a couple of things you need to know coming into this first of all you need to remember that what we're looking at is uh, a system in which we see a, so a star with an invisible dark object moving around it. We know there's an invisible dark object there because we're watching the motion of the central star. So that's the first thing to remember. We're looking at the uh, the bright light from the central star. And the second thing you've got to remember is what we're going to measure of that star is we're going to measure its radial velocity. And uh, you should be clear on what radial velocity means. It's the velocity along the line of sight toward, and, toward us and away from us and it's uh, measured by looking at the spectrum of a star and you should review that and be comfortable with it. So we want to take the example of 51 peg and apply it to this specific example to see the, the amazing things that are involved in discovering these these planets outside our own solar system. Um, this was a discovery that was made in 1995 by two astronomers from the Geneva Observatory in Europe in Switzerland and they looked at a faint star uh, 51 Pegasus in the constellation Pegasus and 51 Pegasus is a uh, a dim star that would be just barely visible to the naked eye if you were at a really really dark site any place in uh, most of the continental United States or in any of the American cities you'd never see this faint star it's, it's much too dim so they looked at this they measured its radial velocity and they made this astounding discovery and, and here's a plot of the radial velocity of, this, of uh, the central star. And just to remind you, the horizontal axis measures time. And you don't have to worry about much of the details of that, except that uh, between this point and this point is about 3 quarters of a year. And then on the vertical axis is plotted radial velocity in meters per second. And we'll say more about that in just a minute. So radial velocity toward us or away from us, above the line is a positive radial velocity, that means the star, the star is moving away from its central point. Below the line down here is um, the star is approaching us, that's a negative radial velocity, that means it's moving toward us relative to the central point of its orbit. So each dot represents a measurement of that star. And uh, what you don't really realize without without uh, a little more additional information is the astounding accuracy that goes into measuring that dot and saying it's right there or that dot and saying it's right there. Um, it's an incredible accuracy. The accuracy is shown to us by the little bitty lines here that give us approximate range of the accuracy. Just to give you an example, if uh, a cop was measuring your radial velocity, a state highway officer, you're, you're, uh, he will, he, you're, you're doing 65 on a highway. Um, the accuracy with which this dot is placed here is as though that cop were measuring your 65 mile an hour speed with an accuracy of 0 0.02 miles per hour. Uh, an astounding accuracy, an accuracy that most astronomers 20 years ago would have said, oh my goodness, well that's uh, way beyond anything we can do. Now the first thing you notice about this, if, if the central star had no motion at all, it would simply lie along the zero line. All of these black dots would just be a horizon horizontally laid out across that line. That would say that the star is not wobbling at all. It's neither going away from us nor toward us. So the fact that the these lines are spread out within this gray region is telling us that the central star is wobbling back and forth, and it's from those measurements that we want to uh, we want to understand the nature of, of that, that object. This is looking a little more closely at, at the central region of that and you can just tell by looking more closely at the same drawing that it really does look as though there's a, um, a kind of a pattern to these to these lines. Now this is a pretty stretched out period of time and what we're going to do with the next graph is we're going to look in detail spread out exactly what's in there and see what it looks like and this is what you see. Um, and you got to notice first of all that the, when you look at the individual dots with this kind of resolution they clearly follow a pattern and the pattern this is the fit to the pattern that's been provided by the astronomer 
um, this is a, a wave that exactly matches these curves. You can see that the, the wave is not too high, it's just at the right height, and they've selected that height so that it exactly matches it. And the wave is not too stretched out or compressed so that every dot lies along that wave. Now there's a lot of work that went into selecting this exact, this exact wave pattern to do that. Um, but you have to understand that that's what tells us now. Now from the fit of that, we know that the, the central star is moving under the influence of a, an invisible planet that's way outside, way beyond the central star. That invisible planet is about the size of one half of a Jupiter. Um, and that, that invisible planet is, is separated from the central star by a distance that's uh, well inside the uh, orbit of Mercury a diff distance that's about one-eighth of Mer the orbit of Mercury's Mercury around our Sun. So this central star uh, is um, pretty bright. It's a central star that has about the temperature of our Sun. It's a little bit brighter than our Sun. And we can calculate that uh, that invisible planet right next to the central star must be uh, baked at a temperature of about uh, 2200 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the hottest oven that any of us have in our kitchens or you know you have to you have to go some to get a temperature on the earth of 2200 degrees so baked next to the star here's an image that shows that that star so bright if you were looking at it from this distance you can barely tell that it's a, a yellow star like our sun this short little distance here is and there's the planet baked in it and boiling from the extreme temperature of that central star so finding an exoplanet involves a lot of uh, careful technology and the results are, uh, are rather astounding. We don't think that a planet that's half the size of Jupiter could have ever formed this close to a central star. So some mechanism must have let it form much further out in the solar system, in its solar system, and gradually drift in until it's locked in at this position. It's an amazing system. We, we can see, uh, here's a plot of, of three different um, exoplanets that were discovered. Here's 51 Peg. There's the exoplanet. It's showing how close it is right in there next to its sun. Uh, 70 Virginis. Virginis is another um, exoplanet, this time eight times the size of Jupiter, a little further out from Jupiter. Um, 47 Ursa Majoris is uh, three and a half Jupiters out at this distance. These are just some of the earliest planets that were discovered, and you can compare what our own solar system is like. There's Mercury, and you can see that 51 Peg is way inside the orbit of Mercury, about an eighth of the way out. Um, and likewise, 70 Virginis is well inside the Earth's orbit. So both of these planets, giant planets that they are, uh, had to form somewhere else and have, have gradually drifted into where we see them now.